Today in the workshop, I am going to be doing a mini review of my lathe. I'll talk about what I like, what I don't like. We'll go through the feature set, cut some chips, and I'll talk about whether or not I would buy the lathe again, given what I know today. So I bought the machine from a company called Warco here in the UK. It's a Chinese import machine, um, and the model number is the GH1330. So that's GH for gearhead. Uh, 1330 is uh, 13 inches swing over the bed, 30 inches between center. So that's uh, about 330 millimeters and 750 millimeters respectively. And it weighs about 600 kilos or 1300 pounds. The machine's got three gearboxes that I'll talk about in more detail later on, and is capable of cutting uh, screw threads in both uh, metric and imperial, as well as module and diametric pitch. It's got a number of interesting features, but uh, I think we should start off with the basic functions of the machine, so we'll get into that right now. The spindle control lever is quite uh, conveniently located next to the apron there, and uh, we push it down to, uh, to, for normal operation and up for reverse. Spindle speeds are controlled by the main gearbox at the top of the headstock here. And we've got two levers, uh, one that selects between a high range and a low range, and then a secondary lever that selects between one of four speeds in each range. So the, uh, as you can see here, we've got a chart. Um, the black uh, ring corresponds to the low range and the red ring corresponds to the high range. The high range uh, goes from 460 up to 2000 RPM, and the low range goes from 300 down to 70 RPM. The gearbox doesn't have a synchro mesh, so it's often um, necessary just to just to wiggle the, the spindle a little bit to uh, to get the gears to engage properly. And needless to say, you don't want to be changing any of these levers whilst the machine's running. I'm just going to have a quick peek inside the head here. There's absolutely no reason to go in here unless you're curious, but it does give you a good insight as to how the, uh, the lathe is actually working. The front shaft's connected directly to the spindle and also the high-low uh, selector lever, um, which actuates those two gears sliding across there. The rear shaft is the main input shaft, and then underneath that, you're the one you can see moving around at the bottom there, is the, uh, is the speed selector shaft that connects the two. The gears sit in an oil bath, and as they uh, spin round, they fling oil everywhere, keeping everything nicely uh, lubricated. Uh, you do need to change this oil occasionally. Once a year is the recommendation, and um, this lathe has three gearboxes. This is uh, the main gearbox, and there's another gearbox under this one for power feed rates and for threading, and there's a third gearbox on the apron itself. On the secondary gearbox, we have a number of selectors and also levers for selecting different gear ratios for um, selecting feed rates for the power cross feed and longitudinal feed, and also cutting threads on, on a, for metric, imperial, module, and diametric pitch. To select the uh, power feed settings that we want, we look at these uh, rows in this little chart here, and also the columns, and we look at the letters on those rows and columns, and we simply set the uh, selectors and the levers to the appropriate combination of, of, of letters that correspond with the feed rate that we want. If the gears aren't lined up, um, which they almost never are, um, it's quite difficult to, uh, to move those levers. So this is where we need to employ the jog button, which uh, just uh, spins the gearbox up and allows us to get those, those, uh, those gears aligned and the, and the levers in the right place. We have a lever here on the apron to engage the, uh, the power feed, and uh, that's the longitudinal feed. And uh, if we move it across and up, we get the uh, powered cross feed, which is really handy for those long facing cuts. We can also reverse the direction of the feed if we want to, which is really handy sometimes if you want to feed away from the headstock, for instance, or if you want to feed out from the, uh, from the center of the workpiece to the, to the outer edge. If you want to change the feed rates at any point, it's just a question of selecting the correct feed rate from the uh, chart and moving the gear selectors into the right position. If, however, you want to do some threading, then we do need to swap the change gears. And the change gears that you need are shown on the corresponding chart, in this case, the metric set. So we've got a 42 uh, pinion, 120 in the middle, and another 42 for the final drive. It's quite a simple job, it takes about three or four minutes. Uh, we just need to take the cover off the end of the machine uh, to expose the gears. And we've got the, the three gears there that we need to change. We've got the pinion, the, uh, the central gear, and the, uh, the final drive gear there. And the machine comes with all the gears that we need to cut uh, metric, imperial, diametric pitch, and module gears, as well as uh, the gears for the feeds and speeds. The machine comes with these lead screw covers, and if we pull that back, we can see the lead screw rotating, and you'll notice that it's turning in the same direction as the spindle. And this means we're set up for standard right-hand threads. If you want to cut the left hand threads though, we flip the, uh, the feed direction there. And if we take another look at the lead screw now, you'll see that it is rotating in the opposite direction to the, uh, to the spindle, which means that we set up four left hand threads. One feature I really like of this lathe is the D14 cam lock chuck mounting system. 
you have essentially three cams on the spindle nose that you know, actuate with the uh, the chuck key. And it's just a question of rotating the uh, cam with the chuck key until the mark on the uh, on the cam lines up with the uh, mark on the spindle nose. And then to tighten the uh, the cam, you just reverse uh, the process and uh, and move that mark in between the two arrows. This really does make changing chucks a breeze, and uh, yeah, I, I really like it. Um, the lathe ships with the uh, the three jaw that you see there, and it also ships with the four jaw. Um, this brand that it comes with, um, I think it's Feruda or something like that. I don't know that brand, but I mean, they seem like pretty decent quality, and it also ships with this 12 inch faceplate. One other thing I like about this lathe is the uh, large spindle bore. It's 38 millimeters, which is about an inch and a half, and it just makes uh, working with larger stock a breeze. So that's uh, it's, a, it's one more one more plus point for this lathe. Whilst we're on the subject, the spindle nose has an MT5 taper, and you get this MT5 to MT3 adapter here, so that you can uh, you turn things between centers. So this leads us on to one thing that I do find annoying with this lathe, and that's the lead screw covers that we saw earlier. Now, I mean, you know, they, they seem to do a reasonable job uh, of what they're, they're supposed to do. But as they compress, you can see they get to a point where they won't compress any further. And that eats into the, your, you know, carriage travel, um, which means that you can't actually turn things right up to the spindle, which is extremely annoying when using shorter chucks like this ER40 collet chuck that I've got here. Even if I wind the compound uh, right in, we still don't have um, enough travel on the carriage there to uh, to get any closer than there with this chuck, which makes it pretty much useless. So I think when I get round to it, I'll uh, I'll remove these lead screw covers. So I'll just talk briefly about some of the other features and accessories. We've uh, we've got the work light there, and we've also got a flood coolant system. So there's a a, a coolant tank um, just under the um, under the tail stock there, and uh, we've got a pump. I've not actually got around to using this yet. I don't really want to deal with all the uh, the coolant and stuff, so I just used uh, coolant out of a can. But um, it's there if I need it. We've also got quite a large chip pan, which is good. We've got a spindle brake, uh, which will immediately arrest the uh, the spindle if you push it down. And of course, we've got the DRO, which has all the usual functions, the absolute incremental mode, the uh, tool library, and so on and so forth. The lathe ships with a fixed and traveling steady, as you might expect, and also this carriage stop with a micrometer built in, which is useful for um, accurately turning up to shoulders, etc. It ships with this bog standard four-way tool post uh, thing that come with most lathes, um, and that was the first thing I changed out. I swapped out for the, uh, for the, the quick change style that's popular these days. And now I'd like to talk about some accessories that don't come with the lathe, but I find really useful anyway. Uh, the first is this uh, 5C Precision uh, chuck. Um, it's a D14 cam lock um, style chuck and just bolts straight onto the spindle nose. And um, yeah, it just gives you that that kind of um, that, that precision that you get with the collet chuck. And uh, I find it really useful when I'm doing uh, lots of repeated work with, uh, with bar stock. Another accessory that I find really useful is this tool turret. Um, I've got three tools loaded at the moment, but it does, it does take up to six and you can just index it around um, that quickly. So, you know, in this, in this case, I'm using the, um, the, the, uh, the center drill, the pilot drill, and then the final drill size. But um, you can put taps, you can put dies in it, that kind of thing. And it's uh, really useful when, when doing small production runs of parts. One thing I don't like so much with this tail stock is, is the movement that you saw there. Um, that is something that I need to address in the future. This is the uh, quick change tool post that I spoke about earlier on. It's a Chinese knockoff of a, an Allurist tool post, I believe. Not sure about that, but um, it's cheap enough and the, the holders are cheap enough. One thing I have done is 3D printed up um, some of these uh, these two holders that just clip onto the back with magnets. Pretty handy uh, to have them in, in at arm's length. And I've also 3D printed uh, holders for the, uh, the chuck keys and also the tail stock attachments that I've got. One other thing that's worth mentioning is the uh, is the gap bed. So if you remove these bolts here, you can actually take this section of the bed out and increase the uh, swing from uh, 330 to 476 millimeters, which is about 18 inches. Now this is obviously precision ground in place at the factory. So once you've taken it out, I don't know what the uh, feasibility of putting it back in in exactly the same place is, uh, and I'm not gonna chance it until I absolutely need to do so. So enough of the chit chat, let's make some chips, shall we? I've selected this um, this mild steel out of my uh, scraps bin. Now, I don't know what alloy it is, but um, I always seem to struggle to get a decent surface finish on this. So I'm using a spindle speed here of 1255. I'm using a depth of cut of 0.25 of a millimeter, half, half a mil off the diameter. So that's about uh, 20 thou, I think, and um, a feed rate of 0.1 of a millimeter. And as you can see here, the surface finish is nothing to write home about. As it's carbide, I suspect we need to be driving it harder to get the best results. So I'm going to take a uh, one millimeter depth of cut here, which is two millimeters off the diameter. And you can already see that we're getting some nice uh, chips forming here and the surface finish is much improved. 
So clearly a deeper depth of cut is giving us a better surface finish um, with this uh, particular insert. And now I'm kind of intrigued as to know like how deep a cut can we go before we start hitting the limits of this lathe. So this is 1.5 mil or 60 thou um, or three millimeters off the diameter. So I don't know if you can hear from the intonation of the motor there, but it's barely breaking a sweat um, at 1.5 mil depth of cut there. Um, so let's push it a bit further. This is four millimeters off the diameter or uh, two millimeters depth of cut, which is uh, what, 80 thou. Still no problem whatsoever. The motor's not bogging down at all. Um, you know, and despite the fact that we've got a lot of stick out here, we've still got a reasonably good surface finish. Um, despite the fact that we, we're, we're taking a reasonably deep cut here for a, for a machine of this size, in my opinion. So now this is a three millimeter cut or 120 thou, uh, so six millimeters off the diameter. So I'm actually quite amazed. I mean, the motor is, it's just not bogging down. It's just plowing through it. We're getting some really big chips here. Um, and, you know, they're turning blue, which means there's a lot of heat going into them. And as we reach that shoulder there, we're, we're four millimeters deep um, and it's still going. However, once I stop the machine, as you can see, the surface finish is suffering now. So I think we've hit the limits, not of the motor here, but of the rigidity of the machine. So I am quite impressed. I mean, if you look at some of these chips, I mean, they're, you know, they're four mil long, they're bright blue. We're not quite into A-bomb 79 territory here, but, you know, I mean, for a model engineer's workshop, not too bad, I think. So let's move on now to talk about why I bought this lathe in the first place. Now, for many years, I um, used a small 7x14 Chinese mini lathe, and I was really happy with the machine. Um, did a great job for what it was, um, but eventually I just got to the point where I, I outgrew it, really. Um, you know, I wanted something bigger, I wanted something more capable, more rigid. And around about this time, um, I'd started a small online shop just making uh, kind of big Larry beads and things like that. And I wanted something that I could do small production runs on uh, a lot more efficiently. With this smaller lay, things like changing the chucks was a bit of a pain. Um, changing the feeds and speeds was a real pain because you had to uh, change the change gears every time you uh, you wanted to change the feeds and speeds, which was a bit of a nightmare. And one thing that I absolutely did want was a DRO. So I went shopping for a new lathe and I did what I normally do. So uh, I went um, looking at uh, the next model up from the one I had already. And uh, and then you start looking at the next one up from that and the next one up from that. And before you know it, you're down a rabbit hole. And uh, yeah, you're uh, you're spending sort of several thousand pounds on a new lathe. But um, what I did narrow it down to was, that, um, you know, I wanted a gearhead lathe. Uh, I wanted a lathe with a DRO. Um, I wanted something with this, you know, D14 cam lock chuck system on it. And yeah, I was initially looking at the uh, the the water. 1236 I think it was which is a slightly cheaper machine than this but um, what I ended up doing was going down to Warco and having a look they've got a showroom um, and uh, I had a look at the lathes in the showroom and um, yeah it quickly became apparent that actually the one that I went for which was the 1330 was a yeah it was just a nicer quality machine I mean they're all they're all coming out of factories in China but um, it just seemed to just seemed to have slightly nicer components um, the electronics were, were were better it just seemed a bit more solid um, and and um, yeah, so that was the one that I went for. So am I pleased with the machine? Um, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I'm really happy with it. Um, it does everything that I want it to do. Um, I've had a few minor niggles that, you know, that uh, lead screw guide thing's annoying, the loose tailstock thing's annoying. I did have an oil leak with the gearbox on the main shaft input to the uh, to the, to the main gearbox um, at one point. But um, Walco were actually very good and they sent me out a new seal, you know, free of charge, which I fitted and that fixed that problem. It seems to be a very capable machine in my limited experience. Um, quality wise, I mean, it's still an import machine. This isn't a Swiss tool room lathe, you know. But for the um, for the for the money, I I think it's. Um I think it's a good machine. So would I buy this machine again? I mean, when I was looking for this machine, I was in the market for a new machine. I, I, I thought at the time I didn't have the experience to go and buy a secondhand machine um, and have all the worry of, you know, is it is it worn out? Um, am I going to be able to restore it? Um, am I going to deal have to deal with, you know, potentially decades old electrics and so on and so forth? So I was definitely in the market for a new machine. And I think if you're in the same, same position, then this is a great machine. Um, having said that, you know, it is expensive. I mean, like this is not a cheap 
machine, right? And for the same money, you know, you could get a lot more for your money uh, if you're prepared to put the work into restoring an old machine. So I think that pretty much wraps it up. I mean, if you've got any questions or there's anything that's not clear, please do um, leave me a comment in the uh, description and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you've got. If you're interested in any more of the tech specs of the machine, they're all on Warco's website. I'll leave a link in the description. For any American viewers out there, um, I know that Grizzly in the US used to offer this exact same lathe, albeit with a, a slightly longer bed. It was The model number was G9036. And the reason I know that is because I've downloaded the manual for it. It is exactly the same machine. And the manual, incidentally, is much better than the Warco one. So anyone that's got one of these lays or thinking of buying one is, is well advised to uh, search that up. If you like this kind of content, um, you know, let me know in the comments. I, I might, you know, review some of my other machines. And as always, um, if you want to support me, then uh, please do drop me a like and a subscribe. It's very much appreciated. Thanks for your time. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you next time.